All right. Well, here we are, live. Okay, so today I am really excited to talk to David Quinby. We're going to be talking about systematic innovation. Yes. Um, what is that? Well, David's going to explain it and probably in great detail. Uh, I might have to curb David because he. <laughs> He likes to go on about systematic innovation, but I'm excited to learn about it from him today. So if you don't know who I am, I'm Kurt Schmidt. I'm the president at Foundry, and we are a custom software design and development organization. And by the way, uh, we just happen to be hiring too. So if you want to check out careers at foundrymakes.com, um, we're going to be, uh, we've got some job postings up there for project management, developers, all those sorts of things. But today let's get into the exciting stuff with David. Um, David, I've got a new window here so we can see both of us. How you doing? Doing great. Glad, thanks for having me, Kurt. Yeah. By the way, I'm not going to take all responsibility for diving deep. I think that's a, a, a mutual uh -huh. uh, mutual endeavor when you and I get, get going. So, that's true. Anyway. That's true. It is a mutual endeavor. Okay. So, David, tell me a little bit about who you are and the work that you do. Sure. So, well, uh, David Quimby, I do like probably way too many things. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a... A, a patented inventor. I call myself an accidental inventor. A patented inventor in the uh, web web architecture space, user experience. Um, I accidentally used systematic innovation in uh, producing that you know that invention, and since since then it's kind of unraveled and and uh, become evident to me. So I um, my day job is is actually licensing that software, that IP, um, and my my. Evening job or night, you know, night job or, or side gig or whatever we call it is commercializing uh, systematic innovation. Uh, I, I call it sort of soft launch, finding where it lands. It's sort of still still emerging, but looking yeah. for um, looking for the path. So. Well, and, and and I'm excited to talk to you about this, David, because you and I obviously we can go on and on about this. Um, but uh, you know, there's everybody from kind of the Clayton Christensen side to, you know, this innovation disruption. There's all these different sort of frameworks and theories and different things that people have put out, right? Because, um, you know, again, the conversation I have constantly with people is, you know, how can you distinguish true innovation from just copying things, right? Um, versus um, what is what is truly something we haven't seen before versus something we just maybe never experienced before. I mean, there's so many different ways to look at it. So tell me about systematic innovation. What's your theory there, uh, David, and how do you best explain it to folks? Sure, and I'll, like you say, let's kind of cut to the chase. I, I also <laughs> like to say it comes in waves, it unfolds in layers, so it does, you know, there are like a lot of layers to it, but, you know, see if we can kind of uh, cut across the top. And and I, I, I agree. There are like lots of lots of approaches to like systematic innovation. Um, I'm a systems thinker, so um, I um, or sorry, lots of approaches to innovation in general, and lots of frameworks, that sort of thing. I'm a systems thinker, so I said, well, how do we apply systems thinking to the process of innovation? Um, and um, you know, of of course. Uh, we can say systematic innovation is sort of like an oxymoron, right? It's like, wait a minute, innovation is like creative activity. It's like throwing paint against the wall, that sort of thing. I humbly disagree. And and I'm really trying to sort of boil innovation down to like the essence. It's like, let's let's make it an unframework if possible. We have unconferences these days, right? Well, how about an unframework? So I think it's a framework without being a framework, which is sort of a contradiction in itself. Um, and, and the central concept of of like my approach to systematic innovation and most of the uh, the uh, more formal approaches to systematic innovation that are out there is to start with a contradiction. Um, and also what's a contradiction? And just to give you a little bit of a preview, I, I sort of do a three-step process. Identify a contradiction and then a really simple but very crucial step invert what I call invert the null hypothesis, which is, is uh, well, explain it a little further. And then, and then we move to um, resolve the contradiction. Um, and what's a contradiction? It's opposing forces. It's two forces that are uh, inherently in tension with each other that to get more of one, you have to give up one or the other. I reject that concept. So <laughs> let's just start, like, like, let's be controversial, you know, so start right from the start. And, and you can say, well, wait a minute, like that's impossible. Well, there's a history of cases where we've done that and there's sure. a future before us of Doing, you know, doing it as well, and um, a simple way of review of viewing a contradiction, like I say, opposing forces, or I sometimes call it 
two hands clapping versus like one hand clapping. Well, like, let's just improve X or improve Y. Well, that's that's fine, but that's not solving a contradiction. How do we take two forces that are in opposition to each other and, and improve them simultaneously? Uh, one way of describing it might be resolution of the of the conflict versus optimization. We tend to optimize, go back and forth, trading off one for the other. But the idea is to stop doing trade-offs, stop doing con compromises, and resolve both both aspects. So, can you give me an example of a, like a real-world example of that? Uh, give me a, con a real-world contradiction, something that people might be familiar with um, that 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 can kind of frame a, this up for folks. Sure. Uh, you know, and there have been whole industries that have been founded. And by the way, everybody doesn't necessarily recognize when they're doing systematic innovation. That doesn't mean it wasn't systematic. It doesn't mean they didn't solve a contradiction. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I like to think of kind of uh, historically, there's a couple of uh, of um, of uh, industries that have really been founded on um, a contradiction. Um, one is I, I had the good fortune to work with a guy at uh, uh, Stanford Research Institute. His name's uh, Doug Engelbart. You probably never heard of him. He's the, probably the uh, most impactful person in, in technology history who nobody ever heard of. He invented the graphical user interface. Uh, he actually implemented the first operational version of hypertext at SRI. I worked with him. I collaborated with him at SRI. After you know, after that era, he and I were actually working around um, social uh, social computing, which became social networking and and onward. Um, but what he did is he came along and he said, "Well, let's see, computers, you know these like technical things." Before he came along, and this is like lost to us, and now we've we've forgotten this concept, kind of like we've forgotten how to manage like epidemics, right? Um, is um, um, uh, so he said, technical technical users use computers, non technical users don't use computers, they use like analog methods, right? And he said, and, and that was a contradiction, right? And and, and every, everything was like a, a trade-off back and forth. The more technical you were, the more technical a machine you could use. And the less technical you were, the less technical the machine uh, you could use. And he came along and said, I'm gonna resolve that contradiction. He resolved right. it with the graphical user interface. It's like that made computing accessible to the masses. I don't so know, does that, that help? Yeah, no, that's good. So you're saying, you know, the, that basically doing the research he found, you know, the more technical you were, the more technical things you applied to um, solving your problem, the more analog you were, the more analog tools you applied to those things. So in order to find that bridge between those two areas, um, you had to marry that analog with the technical side in order to provide a graphical user interface, for example, right? The graphical interface made technical computing available to non-technical users. Mm -hmm. But um, also still made it robust for technical users. Again, you're not, not trading off. You know, we're not, <laughs> no, and that's like, we're not doing systematic innovation if we move into like trade-off mode. I'll mention another one real quick. Feel free to rein me in, but I think, well, I'm, you know, near and dear to my heart, um, you know, here in, in our area, we have this thing called, uh, this phenomenon called Medical Alley, right? Um, Earl Bakken solve the contradiction. I'm not saying Earl knew he was solving a contradiction. One thing I do encourage though is if you solve a contradiction, please, please, please communicate the contradiction that you solve, recognize it and communicate it. So Earl Bakken came along at that, and at that time, cardiac pacemakers were tabletop devices. They yeah. were like desktop sure. computers, right? Yeah. And, 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 and we were losing people, you know, accident or happenstance, he, he, uh, encountered Walt Lillehei, a cardiac uh, surgeon, world famous cardiac surgeon, in the hallway at University of Minnesota Hospital one day, and um, and um, Walt had lost a patient to a power failure like mm -hmm. the day before. He said, and Earl was like an electrical equipment, you know, repairman. He wasn't like some stellar, you know, world class sure. inventor. Yep. But he said, well, wait, we've so we've got small devices, and and. William Shockley had invented the transistor maybe like 10, you know, 10 years earlier, and it was being commercial, commercialized mainly through portable radios. What did we call them? Transistor radios. And we had, um, uh, uh, so we had small devices that were not very complex, and we had large devices that were very complex, you know, tabletop cardiac pacemakers. Earl said, I want to break that. He did, I'm not saying he consciously did this, but the re, the end result was the same. He said, I'm going to break that contradiction. I'm going to break that trade off. I'm going to have, I'm going to have a small device that is um, also complex. And, um, and there, there was born the wearable pacemaker. Um, it wasn't implantable yet. That right. was like another step down the road. But again, he, and he, he founded an industry on it. He founded a regional technical you know, ecosystem on that on that invention. So, how does it 
how does this translate to the, some of those in your mind to some of these other frameworks like the Clayton Christensen sort of thing, right? Because he coined kind of the phrase of uh, is innovation disruption, which I guess people got too lazy by saying innovation disruption, just started saying disruption. Um, the, the How does the idea of disruption follow in what you're doing? Or is that a side effect of the systematic innovation sort of theory you've got? Or is it, or is it all ingrained in one piece? Either and and both. And like, look, look, look out, you know, Kurt, plenty of rhetoric. And, and I'll admit, all roads lead to systematic innovation. You've heard me say that before. Once I like start thinking this way, I see the connections. So um, again, a, a piece of the rhetoric, you've probably heard me say, um, and again, I, I think it's like true. It's probably rhetoric, but doesn't mean it's not true, is I say all systematic innovation, sorry, all disruptive innovation results from solving a contradiction. That's part A. It's like, and take it or leave it. It's like I say, start with a contradiction. That's two hands clapping, solve a contradiction. You will have a disruption. You'll have disruptive innovation. Um, and and the, the, the corollary of the follow-up is, oh, by the way, guess what? Every solved contradiction was once a, was was once an unsolved contradiction. You know, by definition, it's like it, you know it was once unsolved, and it was as unsolvable sure. as all the unsolved contradictions that lie on the path ahead of us. Well, so. and it doesn't have to be this huge, like you're saying, like you know, the foundation of a company like Medtronic. I mean, it could be just as simple as a as a user interface for a new product or something, right? It doesn't have to be systematic innovation. You know, scales. I guess is what I'm I'm getting at, right? Beautiful, beautiful scales. Sometimes I actually do multiple layers, so I'll share a couple personal okay. examples. Yeah. The uh, the um, my accidental invention happened to be it's in in the web space, web architecture, uh, user experience, and I said I want the combination. Uh, we have like a video and and streaming media, which is monolithic. It's continuous and it's like passive. We can like you know uh, absorb it continuously, but it's not granular. It's not contextual like. Uh, point and click web navigation, right? On the other hand, point and click web navigation is like very flexible. You know, it's very contextual, but it's not very continuous. And I said, well, I want I want both of those fused together. And I don't want a trade off between one and the other. I want to take each of them apart and put them back together in a total package that gives us uh, both of those those benefits. And that happens to be the kind of the basis of uh, of mm -hmm. my quote unquote invention, which, you know, I'm drawing, drawing royalties on it now, licensing it. It's it's sort of gathering steam. I sort of, uh, you know, I, I, I used to say it's either the stupidest idea that ever occurred or it's time has not yet come. It's one of those <laughs> sure. rare ideas that um, that I'm probably going to outrun my headlights. I'm going to probably run, the, you know, the, the patent's probably going to run out before it gets fully commercialized. Mm. It, it is being commercialized. A lot of patents never like find commercial value, but I've actually, I think, got four patents around this area. <laughs> that's that's a, one, one example. Um, I'll touch on another um, one real quickly in the realm of COVID. Um, when, you know, when I when I saw like COVID comment at the very, you know, various earliest, earliest glimmers when, so, you know, those, you know, those among us started becoming aware of it. And I've got a little background in graph analysis or network analysis. I had done some uh, analysis of innovation ecosystems using uh, using um, um, graph theory. And I said, well, this is a graph shaped problem. You know, how can we alleviate the, you know, the, the impact using graph thinking, graph analysis, that sort of thing. Again, not trade off, but how can we um, how can we resolve the tension that I saw emerging between what I call biology and economy? And I worked with a I, I collaborated collaborated with a colleague in um, in uh, in Italy who works for a simulation uh, vendor. His name name's uh, Livio Mariano. Shout out to you, Livio. His uh, his his company is um, Altair Engineering. I know uh, him through Venkat Paramashwaran uh, here in in the Twin Cities. Anyway. Um, we looked at simulating the the difference between using graph technology to monitor the the, the virus, um, to the, the the pandemic, versus um, some you know some approaches that weren't as aggressive about using that particular social intervention. And we basically did we 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 did a quantitative analysis, a simulation where we actually took apart. Uh, Korea, South Korea and Italy and what they were doing in terms of like social interventions and their composition, their packages and said, what if we what if we took this, the South Korea package and applied it to Italy? And we actually showed that it would have reduced um, at, at, you know, at, at the end point, it would have reduced um, uh, uh, the death rate by about like 8x. Um, and, and that was an example of saying we don't have to. Um, 
trade-off, this, this trade-off that we're still dealing with at this time um, between biology on one hand and economy and on the other versus I reject that notion. You know, that, that comes to the second step of systematic innovation is to reject the null hypothesis that says we can't get out of this trade-off situation. I just, I naturally do it these days. I just naturally reject a, a you know, a, a null hypothesis that says we can't re resolve that contradiction. And it led us to do this quantitative analysis to run this simulation to say, oh, what can we, you know, what can we reveal here? And we've seen some countries have done a sure. better job than others on resolving that contradiction. Sorry, I keep going like this. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I, I think of upper left quadrant, lower right quadrant versus I want to get to the upper right quadrant. That's the mental model that I use. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes sense. Back to you. So let's let's uh, let's talk about that in the in the again in the practical like in the day to day sense, right? Um, not all of us are trying to solve death rates in COVID. Some of us are just trying to create better home health care situations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure. So, yeah. So um, if you were talking to a founder, uh, somebody who is trying to solve a problem, like let's say in home healthcare and making it safe and easy for people. Um, first, we're gonna start with that contradiction, right? But then secondly, we're going to um, reject a no-win situation, basically, is what is what I'm hearing you say. And then third, what am I what am I doing in that situation? Okay, so and then the third step is once you once you reject the null hypothesis that says the contradiction can't be solved then um, all sorts of opportunities become available to you. I, I, I apply um, uh, what I call system transformations. So um, th the notion of a, a contradiction really comes from a systematic innovation method called TRIZ, T-R-I-Z. It's a Russian method. It stands for um, Theory of Inventive Problem Solving, the Russian acronym. Um, and they have a very sophisticated set of like 40 inventive principles that they'll apply. And it's all, it's very effective. I like to say TRIZ is like exhaustive. There's no, it leaves no room to hide, but you've got to be you know, you've got to be very advanced in your engineering skills. You know, you've got to be like a PhD electrical engineer or mechanical engineer or, you know, really just well practiced, but it's not accessible as far down the chain and as far across the organization, which is why I like to take a simpler approach to solving um, contradictions. But by the way, Kurt, I want to say the biggest part of the problem, again, this is a little bit of a, you know, probably a bias or a, a leaning, is to identify the contradiction. I like to say once that's you identify, gonna, that's, that's, that's the whole shooting match. I was, was going to say, it it's seems like, like the hardest part is the beginning, not the end. <laughs> notice it, notice it, you know, notice it. There's a, uh, I like to quote a guy named um, Albert Zent Gorny, Gior Georgi, I, if I'm getting that right. He's a, a Hungarian biochemist. He run the, he, he won the uh, Nobel Prize in Physiology, I think 1937 or something like that. Uh, his quote, and I like to think of discovery mindset. Um, discovery is what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody has thought. You know, and so a lot of that is like seeing the contradiction. And people say, "Well, how do you get, how do you get trained in in identifying the contradiction?" And I wish I had a magic answer. I wish I had a pill. <laughs> All I can say is like practice, 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 practice. Once you right. once you have worked with a contradiction, inverted the null hypothesis, and then gone into the layers of solving it. I think through that practice, you'll start to see contradictions. All I can say is like I've trained myself to see them. Sure. When it comes to resolving it. I apply, I'm, I'm, I have some systems analysis in my background. I think a lot of the techniques are really just good systems analysis. I have, you know, I use like a lot, a lot of modular architecture. I use like layered architecture. Um, um, I use a, a principle I call appropriate complexity. Sometimes we apply too much complexity, you know, and, and it's, 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 pre it's preventing, so, you know, solution of the problem. Sometimes we don't have enough complexity. Sometimes we need um, a little, you know, a little larger, uh, larger model. Um, but it's, 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 it's a lot of times um, a process of functional decomposition and recomposition, which again, is not as, it's not necessarily science fiction. It's like, it's, 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 mental approaches, mental models, mental disciplines that are a lot further downstream than say the 40 TRIZ principles. Well, and that's the that's kind of where I'm getting to, David, is because like you're saying, it's not, it, we're not inventing the matrix here, right? I mean, this can be as simple as, like I mentioned, solving simple day-to-day -day things that people deal with, right? And so, you know, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about e-commerce, for example, and who's got the best checkout process. and. Um, and, and who has the best shopping cart sort of process. And, you know, my argument was, is I thought Uber has the best uh, checkout process because there is no checkout process. <laughs> you just get out of the car. There's no shopping cart for your taxi and, uh, you know, service and all those things. So 
kind of to your point, um, you know, I feel like, um, you know, saying, you know, somebody saying like, well, we can have a checkout experience with no checkout experience is kind of the definition of like what you're getting at, right? It, they rejected the null hypothesis, Kurt. They just said, we're not going to be limited. And again, it's not magical thinking. And I, I agree, like a lot of times when I, when I identify a solved contradiction, I'll get the feedback. Well, like that's trivial. Well, it wasn't trivial till it got solved. I sometimes like to say everything's impossible until it's possible. And, and I adopt the same mental posture toward unsolved contradictions as solved contradictions. To me, they're really the same thing. They're in the same continuum. Now, some contradictions may be a little farther over the horizon. We need some additional technology, like Earl Bakken needed the transistor, you know, um, but but how do you put the pieces uh, together? Um, and and uh, by the way, it's not necessarily limited to technical uh, innovation. It applies to organizational behavior, um, to, um, uh, to organizational innovation, behavioral innovation. For example, um, the matrix organization is a uh, that's a, a systematic innovation. It said, "We're how are we going to get you know um, uh, uh, two dimensions across an organization? You know, call it functional geographic, or you know, take your pick. Um, you know, functional and business line, or functional and product, or whatever." And it solved that contradiction. It said, "We're not going to give up." Now, again, people can argue our um, our matrix organizations as effective as like, you know, we'd like them to be fair, you know, fair game. Well, maybe it's the network organization then is the next next step. By the way, I'll give you an example of something that's not, um, that doesn't solve a contradiction, uh, okay. which might help. Um, uh, multitasking. Mm. It's a great example. So be careful, you know, be, beware. It's like, <laughs> no, that's, you know, we could fool ourselves. You know, I, I, I don't think it's truly, I, I think as we know around like neuroscience and that sort of thing, we really, we can do rapid switching back and forth, but sure. we're really not very good at doing two things at once and performance suffers. Therefore, I reject the, con now it doesn't mean we won't get to some kind of equivalent when we start having chips in our brains or who knows what, <laughs> right. you know, but. Apple uh, glass, right? So. Apple glasses. Simple, well, ex exactly, <laughs> who, you know, who knows? It might, it, you know, I don't know how, how we're gonna rewire our brains to actually do, you know, two things at once. Um, and maybe a simple example, you know, real concrete. Well, we talked about the cardiac pacemaker, the wearable pacemaker, something like a microwave oven, you know, for example. It's like, oh, you want something hot, you know, but you, you know, you can't get it like right away or you can have it right away, but it's not hot, right? Someone came along and said, and again, they needed some underlying technology, you know, um, but they, someone came along when the technology was right. And maybe that's part of the process as well as I like to talk about like the time elevator or, or an analogy to the uh, to Verizon wireless, you know, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? There may be a contradiction that's just waiting to be solved when like the right piece, you know, comes along. And so like all of a sudden we had, you know, we had the right microwave technology and now we can have hot and now, you know? Um, so anyway, I don't know if that's a right. concrete well, example. Well, helps. but, and, and even further along now, newer ovens incorporate oven technology and microwave technology. So they're even constantly evolving that sort of, um, that sort of piece on top of that, right? Layers and layers. layers so, and, layers. <laughs> and again, connecting tech, connecting the layers is is also you know again I you know I, I say it comes in layers, it comes in waves, it unfolds in layers. When I going back to this biology and economy thing, we started with the meta sort of contradiction. Okay, well, how are you going to do that? Well, we solved it with like social innovation and a particular combination of social interventions that hadn't really been contemplating because of what we felt you know could happen with graph technology, and we actually anticipated. The um, Apple Google announcement around um, the initiative around um, non-intrusive because that's part of the contradiction. We want non non-intrusive uh, contact tracing, and um, and then and then uh, it was actually interesting. We got our, our study published in uh, it's called OR, ORMS today, um, uh, Operations Research and Management Science. Um, it's the Journal of Operations Research. They've had a bunch of. Uh, 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 Nobel Prize winners in economics published in that journal, that sort of thing. We published our um, our analysis on the same day that the uh, Apple Google announcement came along, and that was an example of. And I won't, you know, go into all the layers, but we actually connected three layers of 
um, of, of solving contradictions. We solved the biology economy, we solved the social layer of innovation, and then we got down to contact tracing and said, oh, now we have to solve this contradiction between effective contact tracing, but it has to be non-intrusive. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're taking no prisoners in terms of, oh, it has to be um, you know, intrusive. We said, let's solve that contradiction. Right. Let's have effective contact tracing that's non-intrusive. No, it makes sense. And so let's, let's talk about, um... So, so we talked about the concept, but and you mentioned graphs and things like that. What are some of the tools one can use to kind of go through this process and, and be the most effective with it? What have you discovered? What have you seen other people do? Um, or do, do tools not matter? Um, I, I just know that people really get nerdy about tools. Um, yep. and so I just want to ask you, have you found any um, processes and tools that have worked really well for you in this framework? Sure. No, great, great question. Of course, you and I, Kurt, know and would probably agree that a fool with a tool is still a fool, but it doesn't mean that there aren't like tools. I like to think lightweight in terms of tools. I don't want to start looking at tools as like the answer. Um, but yeah, certainly. So I like to think that, first of all, there's a lot of design thinking in what I do, step by step, incrementally within the broad framework. Like if I'm not careful in listening, like, for example, you talked about well, what if a founder has like an idea. A lot of times, they may not see it as a as a um, as a contradiction, but I'll 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 just I'll listen and I'll, I'll I'll watch for where is the contradiction in there. And a lot of times it can be formed into a contradiction. Well, that's just design thinking. That's just like you know uh, being aware, you know, empathizing and being aware of the context. Um, and it I think it fits you know kind of up and down the chain in terms of um, the broad kind of you know the broad approach. Um, I think a lot of tools. You know, I'm gonna say that that are not like necessarily electrical engineering tools or me mechanical engineering tools, but I think of as tools of systems analysis are really effective as thinking in a systematic way. Um, and by the way, systematic doesn't mean all scientific. I think there is, as I just alluded with design thinking, there's both a science and an art. And by the way, in the middle is a bunch of philosophy, thinking sure. about like logic. I, I kind of use the dialectic method, the Hegel uh, um, um, uh, um, thesis, antithesis, Synthesis is really kind of like the three the the, the three step process. I, so I'd say there's like a lot of a lot of logic uh, uh, threaded liberally with um, um, creativity, um, but it's not throwing paint to the, against the wall. So there is an overarching general um, approach of identify a contradiction, invert the null hypothesis, which is a really simple step, but it's critical because I can guarantee if you don't invert the null hypothesis and say the problem can be solved, you're never going to solve it. You're never going to see the solution. And then moving on to the identification of a solution, mm -hmm. which is a lot of times not these 40 arcane, you know, Triz inventive principles necessarily, not that they won't like help at some point, sure. but I first think about what I call functional decomposition. There's a great page, by the way, on, on Wikipedia, functional decomposition, taking the two dimensions that are in tension apart, looking at, at what's composing them, taking them apart and recomposing them in, um, in, in, in more optimal ways. Um, and I, you know, uh, I, I think that, um, I, like I said, I have like six or seven, what I call system transformations that I can articulate, uh, further, but a lot of it comes down to kind of systems thinking, but systems thinking intermingled with or creative thinking as well, or intuition intermingled with an analytical approach. It probably sounds like it's not concrete enough, and that brings us back to, well, but I'm trying to stay light. I'm trying to, you know, not, there's not a formula. I'm not pretending there's a formula, but there is is an approach. So right. I don't know a, if that's- It's not a catch-all, right? It's not yeah. a, it's not a, this is, you know, well, and I think that's, that's mm -hmm. what I see happen with innovation frameworks in general, David, and I'm sure you've seen this, is that, you know, if you go to, um, you know, IDEO and you get trained in design thinking, you, in a lot of cases, people become zealots around design thinking is the solve, the other way to solve those things. If I go through and read all of Clayton Christensen's books and things, I'm going to, I'm going to find, if I read Lean Startup, like that's, that's my innovation sort of track. I become kind of a zealot uh, in some case. I've sp spoken with these people. Those are the same people that walk into organizations and be like, you're not agile, you know? Um, <laughs> Great, great, 
Great point, Kurt. You're ringing all my chimes. And it's back to this notion that it's, I suppose it's kind of meta, but you and you know, we, we both sort of get meta sometimes is, is, is that it's a, back to this on framework or being a, being a framework without being a framework. It's like resolving that contradiction, you know, because what are you going to do when the framework doesn't have the answer? So maybe it's better to call it a mindset than a framework. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Or maybe there's a balance or a trade off between being a general, I would say mindset first. I can offer like some tools and some pointers. And by the way, it's better taught in practice. The, the way I try to convey systematic innovation is pointed out when it happens, either in a collaboration, I'll say, wow, we just did it. Hey, this is an example. You want a definition like this is an example. Or when someone's working on idea and an idea and, and try to pull the contradiction um, out of it. So again, it's back, you know, it's back to that tension of being a, you know, being a framework without being a framework. Because what are you going to do? when the framework ends. What are you going to do when the framework doesn't apply to your context? Like a, you know, like a formula, it doesn't like fit in the bottle or, or whatever. And we're in an era where that's exactly, you know, what's yeah. relevant, I think, is there, the formulas aren't going to work anymore. We're going to have to be more right. adaptive, more interactive, more, more, I guess, I guess jazz-like or improvisational work right. with on the fly. So how can we have an innovation approach or mindset but it doesn't operate as sort of a formula or methodology. I, I love know. it, David. Well, David, I want to thank you for joining me today. I'm, again, you and I could probably go on for about another six okay. hours about this. Sure. Um, but I, I really enjoyed the way that you think. Uh, it always sparks some uh, creativity for me, and I certainly hope it did for the people that are watching this today. So, David, if I want to know more about the work you do, if I want to get in contact with you, like where's... Sure. Thanks for asking, Kurt. Innovationradiation.com. That means distributing innovation. And I, I talk a little about systematic innovation there, as well as technology forecasting and experimental design. Yeah, give me a shout. Love to talk about it, as you can see. you know. And as I've said, all roads lead to systematic innovation. So That's great. Thank you, you, David. No, again, thanks for having me, Kurt. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Um, I, I'm. Thank you for taking the time. I, 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 like I said, I always truly enjoy our conversations. So for those of you watching, um, next week we're going to be going back to uh, talking about how to find work. Um, we're going to be going through uh, my sort of resumes part two sort of process on how to build up your career and build up those things. And obviously, you know, we're going to be always talking about innovation on the show. So um, if you have questions or comments, please leave them into the comment form down there. Um, and then I hope to see everybody here again next week. Thanks for... Thanks for joining us.